I guess I, I'm not sure who's going to come. And so I think we'll just get started. This is a client of mine. She's a current client of mine. I'm actually going to see her again um, tomorrow, Friday. I wrote up a little thing about her. There's more information. So what we'll do is I'll read through it out loud as you read through it and explain a little bit more, uh, fill in a little bit of the gaps. And then um, I first question on my list is what, what other information do you want? And if I know it, I'll tell you. And if I don't, then maybe I'll ask her tomorrow and then we can kind of talk about her today and maybe I can post a little bit more about it tomorrow after I see her. So this is a 40 year, 49 year old client. She's a woman who complains of chronic pain in the bilateral plantar fascia. So both sides plantar fascia prohibits her ability to walk and exercise. Her pain started suddenly when she transitioned from swimming to walking for exercise. So she was a college level swimmer, um, transitioned, moved away, actually moved to Europe from California, didn't get back to swimming, decided she was gonna do a walking program instead. And she does a little weight program as well. The pain resolves with rest, but every time she tries to walk again, the pain returns and goes into the back of the heel as well. So it's not just bottom of foot, it's the back of the heel. This, um, she saw a podiatrist who created custom orthotics for her. After using her orthotics, she developed this lateral thigh and leg pain on the left. Now this is a time after. So I want, I want to make sure I get that timeline close to correct. I think it's been two years with the plantar fascia battle going on. Oh. And then, um, and then the pain in the heel started about that same time. So it was plantar fascia pain, pain going up into the heel. She got the orthotics, uh, the custom orthotics. They seemed to be doing fine. And then I would say last year or maybe a year and a half ago. So this is at least six months after the orthotics. She developed lateral thigh and leg pain on the left. The pain is worse at night and wakes her up, keeps her up at night. It can be that bad. Massage seems to relieve the pain, but during COVID, she wasn't able to get a massage. And so her symptoms have been worse. This year, this last August, she traveled on an airplane and in the car. So not super long things. Um, she had a severe episode of lower back and SI joint pain. The pain took two weeks to resolve, but still feels tentative. Like, like it's gonna happen again anytime or could happen again anytime. She then took a long flight this February and again feels that she's at risk of the lower back and SI joint pain coming back. The pain in the lateral leg and thigh to continue to limit any attempt at walking. Since the last episode of SI joint pain, she reports that in the past, she also had lower back and SI joint pain, but that has not bothered her for the last several years. She has pain with hip flexion and adduction, which is kind of this we, in physical therapy, we call it kind of a combined motion. So it's hip comes up and slightly across. So coming up in that across motion really pinches at the front of the hip for her. Um, that would be that flexion adduction pain. And then she's considerably overweight. She's very aware of it and sensitive about it. It's something that happened. Um, there was a traumatic event in her life and that's where, when the weight gain started and she hasn't been able to get, get it off since then. Her posture is hyperlordotic, significantly hyperlordotic with um, a slight anterior tilting of the pelvis. So there's a lot of things going on here. Um, I'll let you think about it for a minute and see if you have questions about if there's any more information I could give you about her or if there's anything you'd wanna know that, that is not here for you. I'm not gonna be very good at this one. Um, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is like what shoes she was wearing when she started walking. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's, yeah, that's a fantastic question. I've had the privilege of being able to see her kind of intermittently through all of this. So I haven't been able to see her continuously at all, but just in inter when things get really bad, then I get the phone call, mm -hmm. right? So she initially, she was at, when she got the orthotics, she was in hokas. She was wearing hokas, which are pretty squishy, um, pretty stable shoes. And then the orthotics went in there. And so before that, she was wearing not, not good shoes. My impression is when the plantar fasciitis set in initially, 
that she wasn't wearing good shoes. She is actually a bit hypermobile and she's grossly overweight. So I think that, that those are all, and, and her age range, that's high risk for plantar fasciitis. That tends to be the demographic for high risk of plantar fasciitis. Plus she had two kids, which makes her more mobile, if anything else. Um, the initial was, let's, let me give you foot and leg exercises. Go see the podiatrist and let's get you some custom orthotics. Like you're in too much pain. Let's see what the podiatrist says. And then see, um, and he saw her and right away said, let's make you some orthotics mm -hmm. about it. She never got a ton of relief from the orthotics. Um, but she thought maybe I just need more. Maybe I just need to get stronger again. Mm -hmm. When um, went back, she's living in Denmark. So she was in California when we did this whole orthotic thing, went back to Denmark, thought I'll just exercise and see if I can lose weight and exercise and make this go away. Um, and then what happened is she started this lateral leg pain and mm. that, that is now worse than the plantar fasciitis. Right. So, um, that part so I'm this, confused about, ahead, confused about the lateral leg pain. Yeah. I mean, all I can, if I'm thinking about the feet and the plantar fasciitis, it's like when you're, you're kind of flattening out your arch is collapsing a bit exactly yeah, yeah. so you the plantar fascia doesn't like it the plantar fascia sits under the foot and its job is really to hold up I like to say it holds up the bottom of the foot hold mm -hmm. your arch in place mm -hmm. if um it gets too stretched out if it gets too much bounce if you don't strong enough to hold that arch up and it happens a lot during pregnancy and after pregnancy too that the arch can um can drop more so um if that's happening a lot then the fascia gets tears a little bit gets micro tears in it and inflammation and that's kind of what plantar fasciitis is usually um and and what's interesting about it right is that it goes under the foot and it's fascial right under the calcaneus the heel bone here let me grab my little skeleton <laughs> francesca <laughs> She'll help us out here. So the plantar fascia travels right under the foot mm -hmm. um, to the calcaneus here. Then we have the fascia from the gastrocrate Achilles tendon that comes onto the calcaneus right here. Mm -hmm. So there tends to be a really close connection between plantar fasciitis and Achilles tendonitis. Mm -hmm. And they both pull on the calcaneus. And so sometimes people really get kind of a bony spur at the back of their heel from all the pulling or under their heel or at the back of the heel where the fascia, either Achilles or plantar fascia can be. So heel pain with plantar fasciitis is not that uncommon, mm -hmm. but, um, but okay. So we take somebody with plantar fasciitis and we put them in an orthotic. An orthotic is gonna change the mechanic of walking. Mm -hmm. So um, I actually just, I mean, I've been sitting with this thing because of the, the chronic pain and I really want to help her here I've been sitting with it thinking maybe I got the timeline wrong on the foot the orthotic and the lateral leg pain maybe I didn't spend enough time looking at her walking mm. right and what do you think if we even forget about the plantar fasciitis if somebody comes and says I have lateral leg pain hip and leg pain what are some things that you might think about that could be causing that pain mechanically? Um, well, I'm thinking the, maybe the ankle joint is out of, she's walking either pronated or supinated and something is, has misaligned up that chain. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, there's, I'm, I'm thinking with the, with the hip pinch that her, her femur isn't seated maybe correctly, which could be, I don't know. Like, this is where I get slightly confused. <laughs> something's out of yeah. alignment and it may be stemming from her ankle causing something to have rolled out. Mm -hmm. Out, exactly. So if you, you can experiment on yourself, if you stand and roll to the outside of your feet, then you'll feel tension um, or maybe some pulling down the lateral lower leg at least. Mm -hmm. Right, if we were into the outside edges of the feet. So um, that's, 
so what I started thinking in this past month or last time I saw her, hi, welcome. If you're just joining, I'm Zaina, by the way, welcome. Glad to have you. <laughs> um, we, so I'm, it, I'm wondering if we put an orthotic on a foot and then somebody develops lateral leg pain, especially if it was down here, I would think, I wonder if she's now too supinated. Mm. Is the orthotic holding her in too much of an uh, supinated position? Yeah. And is that what's causing pain? So that's an interesting question that I have that I want to see if I can find the answer to when I see her tomorrow. But the interesting thing is, is the pain is less down here and more up here. It does travel, she says, but the pain is more up in this like IT band lateral leg area than what she complains about down here. And then we have this compounding kind of SI joint instability is what I would probably call it at this point, that sitting for a long period of time made this feel uncomfortable. And um, she was in, when I saw her in August, she was in severe pain here. When I saw her just now in February, in January, end of January, she was in more pain in here, but she said, I feel tentative, like this SI joint thing that happened back in August might happen again if I'm not careful. Hmm. So, um, so it's interesting, but this is why, you know, it's great to, what, what I think, what I think I would encourage you to do is kind of uh, be an investigator, ask questions, you know, like, you don't have to know all this. I don't think anybody knows the answer to this question. Not even a really clever doctor at this point doesn't have all those answers, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's not so much, for me, it's not so much about answering all the questions. It's about wondering, wondering and creating questions and then figuring out what you can actually do to help somebody like her. So if you were going to, so the second question here I put down is, what would you like to see or assess with her to gather more information? What could you do? What would you look at um, that might help you figure out your, I mean, as a Pilates instructor, our job is to see if we can help her get functionally better, get her stronger, right? Get her stretched out, right? That's fix her posture maybe. Those are the things that we can really do as a Pilates instructor. So what do you wanna know about, what would you wanna see on her? What would you wanna look for? Um, I think like what you said, like, look at her gait, how she stands, how she walks, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> even how, you know, the sit to stand just to see how all of that alignment is happening when she's coming up and down. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Let me throw something at you. What is a typical gait pattern? If somebody is overweight, quite a bit overweight, what is a common gait pattern what are some things that you might see um, when they walk? Let's see, maybe a shorter stride. Mm -hmm. And um, more? More back and forth and less up and around. Yeah, so, and the inner thighs? <laughs> what about the inner thighs? Yeah, what about the inner thighs? Oh yeah, if they're, it, um, because they might not be able to get together, it's more of a, I hate to say kind like a working. waddle. <laughs> Yeah, it is a little more side to side, right? A little more lateral. Yeah. Um, a little more lateral gait because of a lot of soft tissue. Right. And so, um, and that is the case here. Okay. There's a little bit more side to side motion. So that can ultimately put somebody outside a little bit more on the outside edge. And that doesn't have to be just at the foot, right? That could be kind of to the outside of the thigh as well. Right. If you have to walk with a wider gait, you may be walking on sort of the outside, using the outside lateral muscles um, and not able to access the inner thighs as well. Yeah, So, which is going to so put that, stress on that whole outer, exactly. I mean, the IT band, right? Like you said in the anatomy, like there's not a whole lot on that outside keeping you together. <laughs> it's all on the inside. Yeah, so, it's the end, so it's stress, the fashion. Yeah. Maybe yeah. it's just pulling everything. Yeah. Yeah. It may well be pulling. She may be getting a, just excessive tension just because of her gait pattern. Mm. And it may or may not have anything at all to do with the orthotic. Mm. 
but that is a question to have right is hmm, i wonder so okay let's say that um what one other question i have here right and that is um and i didn't write it down here she has a family history of osteoarthritis mm. so she's only 49 now um it's not typical her mom had i think both knees replaced and her grandmother had I don't know which joints replace, but either hip or knee replacements as well. Um, 49 is pretty young, but she's been really overweight for the last 20 years. Mm. So um, is 49 too young? No, I've, I've seen lots of clients who've had to have hip surgeries because genetically they just didn't last. Their joints just didn't last as well um, mm. as some other people that, and that does happen, but we do look at family history for osteoarthritis. Um, so. I worry that the if we think about that flexion adduction, which again is this sort of um, flexed and in inward mm -hmm. motion, um, there's a couple things. What structure? What big structure is right here in the front of the hip here? Oh, your psoas. Psoas, right? Psoas gets angry when it gets squashed if it's irritated. Mm. Yeah, she's super tight in her hip flexors. So it could just be that that flexion adduction, taking that knee up and across is just pinching an irritated psoas and that's the feeling she's having. But the other really interesting thing that pops in my head is that people who have osteoarthritis at the hip complain of groin pain, mm. pain around the groin area a lot of the time. And it can really mimic the pain from psoas um, as well. So, and then the, on the other side of that, psoas can affect the alignment at the SI joint, which she's having trouble with. So, you know, we have a lot of questions here about what could be causing what. So I did ask her if maybe she'd be willing to get a hip x-ray. Mm. And the reason for that is more just to rule that out of the picture, that there's not a hip issue that we're missing that's causing all this radiating pain down the leg. Because if that's the case, there are some things we can do to help her, but there's a limit to what we can expect as a, as a treatment, as a result. And it may change what we ask her to do for a home program, right? And it, would the x-ray show the osteoarthritis? Does it? Mm -hmm. yeah. X-rays, x-rays pretty much will pick up things going on wrong with the bones. So they could pick up, the x-ray could pick up osteoarthritis. Um, an MRI would be needed to pick up any soft tissue issues. Like um, if there's something wrong with the soft tissues, the ligaments or the labrum, then she'd need really an MRI to see if any of that was happening. But an x-ray is um, pretty inexpensive. Um, most insurances would cover it with sort of a chronic situation like this. And so I said, you know, if you're up for it, maybe see if you can get in and get an x-ray done. Let's just rule out that we're not dealing with osteoarthritis and that that's you know, not causing this the symptomology that you're having, even though she's on the young side, mm -hmm. you know? So, um, so hopefully I'll, she'll have that tomorrow. We'll see. I sent her a message earlier this week and I didn't hear back. So um, I'll see if we have that. So the idea as kind of a, when, when you look at something this complex is to just think about think about i wonder what this could be i don't have to know what it is um the doctors don't know what it is yet i don't have to know what it is but what i need to know is how i can help her what kinds of things i could do so then that sort of leads us into the next question is where would you begin to work with a client like this yeah um i guess um i'm thinking you know strengthening the foot of course and mm -hmm. working working on the yeah the um supination pronation to, to see where she is because if it's you know like you said if it's the orthotics have pushed her then we need to bring her back maybe i don't know um and and see where the arch is yeah try, try to strengthen that arch and that all the all the foot muscles really mm -hmm. um and make sure that it's also mm -hmm. mobile because we don't you know if we're always wearing shoes especially shoes with the orthotics that she may have lost mobility in her feet yeah a little yeah. bit mm -hmm. um so if 
if you have a, a, a more lateral gait, um, is it still helpful to strengthen all of the inner thigh, that ab adductor, um, mm -hmm. to try and balance out whatever's, you know, stretch the outside and try and strengthen the inside, even though you may not be able to quite yeah. come as close I mean, as you should be. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think so, right? Because we need we need to be able to pull to that midline to get mm -hmm. ourselves upright anyway. Yeah. So I think I would definitely go go for strengthening the inner thighs. Um, I would go for strengthening the inner thighs. I don't know if you know this or if if I even talked about it in the anatomy course, but if we do activate inner thighs, we do actually also activate a little bit the pelvic floor just by default. Mm -hmm. So that activating her inner thighs, activating the pelvic floor is going to help her lift upward off of her feet, right? Mm -hmm. So we can get a little less pressure down, down and out, basically. So we can get her up and off the feet, arches lifted. Like you said, I love that you want to work on her feet. Um, and I, and I think, um, so I think working on her feet is a great place to start. Take a look at her. I, I love to get people on the reformer and look at what their feet are doing there, mm -hmm. right? So feet on, balls of feet on, um, heels on. Where do they sit? What is she doing? Is she rolling out? Is she rolling in? Is she holding steady? Is she able to do a proper calf raise or do her ankles go all over the place? You know, it's such a great place to just keep assessing and mm -hmm. correcting and teaching, you know? So if all you did with her was footwork, you would have helped her already, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, so I think that's a fantastic place to go with a client like this. And what's so great about footwork, I would actually probably put it on the reformer versus the chair, which is mm -hmm. probably what you had in mind anyway, but because then it's supporting her back also. And I don't have to worry about the SI joint and the lower back at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, um, and then, okay, so let's do it. Say the footwork feels good. You make some corrections. She's doing all right. What could, what could we do for this um, core area and hip and potential SI joint instability? What are some things that maybe could be helpful there? Um, so with the psoas, how do you, I don't need, how do you stretch the psoas? Yeah. I'm not sure how that, I've seen things where you, where you kind of like relax it, where you, you know, you lie on the floor and you put your legs up, but that's, that's kind of just more of a relaxing kind of thing. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great question. How do you release the psoas? <laughs> yeah. I love that question. Okay. I, so as I think, um, is a big battle to fight sometimes my, so I have a favorite way to stretch the psoas open. Um, the most, the easiest, most common thing and most Pilates thing would be kind of the Eve's lunge idea at the side of the mm -hmm. reformer. Mm -hmm. One leg back, back leg straight, knee straight, and the back knee bent in the front, and you're just pushing out, right, and getting that um, open. However, that goes wrong a lot of the time because of posture, and it's standing on one leg, and the other leg is going in the other direction with weight on one, with weight on both, actually, if we're even pushing the reformer. Mm -hmm. And so for an SI joint, if we start splitting the legs apart, and especially if we do that with weight, that can put a lot of tension on the SI joint itself. So um, we could have this sort of position. I know it's not this big, but <laughs> bear with me here. But that actually is going to move the SI joint around. It has to, it's supposed to. Mm -hmm. But if somebody's having any issues here, I worry that first of all, they don't hold their hips still. A lot of people just rotate when their leg goes back, mm -hmm. seen that, right? Um, so in order to keep more stability, my favorite way is to actually put the hips on the roller and stretch the leg down. Do you know that oh, one? Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so hit the roller kind of across this part here mm -hmm. and then one knee to the chest and one leg stretching out. Mm -hmm. What that, why I like that so much is because it, stabilizes the SI joint. And then we have the legs going in opposite directions because we need them to, but there's no body weight on them. So there's a lot less pressure 
on the SI joint itself. And, and then again, the roller is kind of stabilizing it a little bit, holding it in place. So you can at least feel when it's moving or when you're moving funky, mm -hmm. if your hips are already on the roller. So um, that's my favorite way to stretch it. But lately, and I, I have to say, it's really in the last six or eight months that I've really challenged, I've been challenged with people with psoas that don't want to release in a passive way. And so I still don't, I, I like the lunge series for people who are fine, healthy, but for people who have really dysfunctions going on, the lunge series seems a little bit difficult for them to keep the torso in the right place, not arch their lower back. Um, so what I've started doing is challenging the psoas by using the glutes in opposition. Hmm. Meaning a lot of times if we can get one set of muscles to oppose a tight set of muscles, we can release the tight muscle by using the muscle underneath or in the opposite side to turn it off. Mm -hmm. And so one really great way to do that is in bridging. Mm -hmm. if I, that's going to get rectus going. It's also going to get so as a little bit, so or hip flexors in general. So you could do it with just a regular bridge. Right, so I could do a regular bridge up. I could bring the legs in a little bit and just work to press up through the glutes to open up the front of the thighs and hips. And then I could work my way back down. Or what I'm finding is really, really working well these days is um, hips go on the roller here. Mm -hmm. And then I'm gonna hollow and squeeze, press upward. So I'm really trying to open this and open the whole front of the leg, squeeze those glutes up. Um, and here I'm in that coccyx curl. So I'm really working to open. I can feel a stretch through rectus. Mm -hmm. um, it's also just asking those hips to come open for me. So it's an active way to stretch the hip flexors I find if I, I this is our the one I was talking about before right really trying to open here mm -hmm. keeping the belly hollow so this is a really nice passive stretch but then I could after stretching there perhaps come up into that bridge actively and see if I can just push the glutes into the front of the hips to open up a little bit more mm -hmm. so that's something um, that I've been feeling like is working pretty well so if you could get her or somebody to do that kind of a active stretch or active release, I think that could be really helpful too. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's talk about what exercises would you av avoid or are there any contraindications? Well, kind of like what you said with the SI joint, anything that's... Um another technical term slippy, like, um, yeah. you know, anything that's like, I wouldn't do standing splits or anything on the, on the reformer, um, or sideway, like no, none of that kind of stuff. No, mm -hmm. no, um, nothing slippy. Um, I wouldn't so, do uh, oppositional leg motions. I think. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> um, Yeah, I think I would agree. I think um, I might avoid just in the beginning any, just because of that excess lordotic, any kind of extension that wasn't very well contained, just because mm -hmm. generally it would come in the low back. If she's already that way, it yeah. might, she might just go there first. Yeah, I agree. I think you're right. She may just go there first instead of going um, into the hip, for example, for extension or um, even an upper back stretch. Yeah. So yeah, I would do a very, very controlled extension work. Yep, I agree. Yeah, and then not knowing more than that, I mean, I think I would just look at her pain and if it's something's causing her pain, it's not gonna be beneficial to her to work through it. Yeah. So anything that causes discomfort, I wouldn't be doing. Yeah. Um, and I'd probably watch out for anything loaded in the lower spine and just because of that lower spine SI joint pain and not knowing. Mm. The, the other thing that we haven't mentioned is we can have an issue, a disc issue 
or a nerve issue from the lower spine that radiates all the way down that lateral leg. So that's our sort of other unknown is if it turns out that this x-ray comes back negative, her hip is fine. Then we need to look at, okay, is there a nerve issue coming from the lower back or the SI joint? Mm -hmm. So just in, in an excess of, excess of caution here, I would probably say, don't do any loaded flexion mm -hmm. until you know more, right? And plus somebody who's overweight with SI joint issue, rolling up and down that SI joint is just not gonna be great anyway. Yeah. So I would, I would probably not do any of that um, for now. Yeah. Um, okay, and then what, what could be a plan? I said come up with a client plan in terms of like, okay, you see her today, you give her some foot exercises, you get her on the reformer, you do some footwork, um, and then she goes home and she's coming back in a couple days, you get to see her again. Where, a short term, what would be some of your goals for her? Um, well, to be able to walk without pain, I think would be good. Great goal. Um, yeah. Especially if she, that's her new form of exercise and then it, she can't really do her new form of exercise mm -hmm. because she's yeah. got too much pain. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So great. I love that as a long-term goal. How, what are some steps along the way, like in terms of very practical Pilates applications, if we did footwork this time, what could we do? What do we need to incorporate into her program? Um, well, strengthening, um, <clears throat> Where, where would, where do you think some primary hits would be for strengthening for her? Um, feet, lower leg, maybe um, hips. Mm -hmm. And? Abs, core. <laughs> <laughs> and there's one more, the backside of the core. Her glutes. <laughs> yeah, backside. Yeah, yeah. Um, glutes, because that will help stabilize the SI joint. Mm-hmm core and glutes will help stabilize the pelvis and the SI joint. So, and, and we've, the research shows all kinds of great results from core strengthening. Um, I like to use bilateral glute contractions to stabilize the SI joint, meaning laying on the tummy, doing kind of the leg lifts, uh, Charlie Chaplin or heel clicks, and then kind of the glute heel squeezes. I like those because they're symmetrical. Mm -hmm. And so if, if there's a problem with asymmetry or her hip, uh, a side joint moving around. Um, I would think that the double leg work would keep her a little more stable until she develops more stability. And then abs is a hard thing because we want to strengthen her abs and her deep core. Absolutely. But if, let me tell you what happened when we did some of that. We put her on her back. We took her legs to tabletop. And the minute we take her legs to tabletop, she complains of hip flexor tightness and pain. Her hip flexors start gripping. Uh, All right. So that tells you two big things. One of them is that her core is really weak mm. because she can't hold her legs in tabletop. The second one is that her hip flexors are really overworking and really irritated, or at least the one is. So how do you strengthen somebody's abs who you can't hold in tabletop? Um, <clears throat> well, let's see. So maybe not supine work. You could do, I mean, uh, immediately I, what comes to mind is like the reverse knee stretches. But then again, I don't know if she can tolerate. I mean, her knees, it sounds like her knees are okay. So she her can knees tolerate are okay. kneeling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I just might flip the, the gravity. So maybe the, the knee stretches, those are kind of tricky. Um, tricky. Yeah. But you're on track. I think that would be a great way. Um, so we already said the glute series, I think anything I probably would wouldn't even try to put her on her back with legs and tabletop, unless we put some support for her legs or maybe even put her into a flat back position. So maybe put a wedge under her butt mm. to start out just to mm -hmm. make it easier for her to hold tabletop or put her feet over the bar on the tower 
or put our feet in the springs, the leg springs, yeah. so that we take some of the weight away. But we might have to do that with a little wedge underneath her, uh, underneath her hips, just to make sure that we she's strong enough and that her hip flexors don't take over. We want to find a place where she can actually feel her abs come on and start working. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if I was going to go supine, it wouldn't be on the mat, probably. Yeah. Um, it would be with some assist. And then prone is great because it opens, forces open the hip flexor, but there's only a limited amount of ab work you can actually do while you're laying on your stomach, right? It's really just holding your stomach up. So, mm -hmm. and then the, the glute work we're already doing, which can help planks could work mm -hmm. if she's strong enough for a plank that can work your abs too. Um, and then you're right. Anything in quadruped, that would be a great place. Even doing an, I, I like to do an active cat where you're using your ab muscles to pull up mm -hmm. away from gravity and then back to neutral. So you're activating your abs to create that motion rather than doing a cat for a stretch purpose. So that could be one way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So just being creative about how you're strengthening um, her abs. And then the, if we are going to go to her back, maybe the first positions would be diamond legs so that her legs and knees are fall, falling open rather than having, so that make it harder to access the hip flexors if she's fall, falling open than having them right up in tabletop. So even putting them um, on the box a little higher up with a little diamond shape uh -huh. or a frog shape, and then have her doing a little ab work there. Um, coccyx curling, maybe a little upper ab, just something to get her going in that middle section a little bit. What would you think about like, um, I have one of those arcs the the styrofoamy mm -hmm. thing yeah if you, if you sit on that and go from a little extension just up to neutral and then a little mm -hmm. extension and up to neutral and then the your your back is supported and it keeps you in a nice position yeah i mean you might be able to do that and you actually might be able to do that with legs in the diamond shape mm -hmm. over the edge so if we took take it um yeah <laughs> This one? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you might be able to take take her. So if I had her come way out here, because I don't want to compress the SI joint in there, right? And support her head, I could go down and up into a little upper ab. I think that would be great. And then it, but she may still be a little grippy in the hips. So you might actually be able to even take her into this position. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay and then have her work there. It's just harder to get the hip flexors to pop and work if the legs are out to the side. So um, so this might be helpful coming up into there. Yeah. Yeah, so I think that could work too. I would just be careful about um, having her um, load her SI joint, but I think okay. here we're, we're pretty good. Yeah, so just not so putting the putting the SI joint into a flexed position where she's unloading it would be the only caveat. But I okay. think for the rest of it, it's great. Yeah. Yeah, so I think um, working on feet first, I think that's a great idea. Um, strengthening core glutes. Um, perhaps creating some hip range of motion. Mm -hmm. So um, that could be my favorite way to do that is actually putting the feet in the springs on the tower and just working on leg circles mm -hmm. with stable, stable center. So we're stabilizing her center. She used to work for that. And then we're creating these leg circles to just lubricate the hip joint. So if I'm suspecting any osteoarthritis, they usually really appreciate those leg circles because they, just make the joint feel good. It gets mm -hmm. the synovial fluid moving around. They don't have to be big or crazy, just small circles would be fine. But just to get that motion going um, mm -hmm. might be nice. And then um, working on, I, so I'd probably progress her from prone positioning to a little bit of supported supine, like we talked about either wedged or legs and straps, um, quadruped activation, any, any, anything on any apparatus in quadruped. Um, and then 
perhaps even sidelining sometimes we can get good stability. Um, it is a, can be a little bit shearing on the SI joint though, so it would be down the road maybe a little bit. But mm -hmm. sidelining hip work, but keeping the hip a little bit in extension rather than in flexion. Yeah, so keeping that hip open as she's doing up, down, circles, whatever she's doing with that leg that she's lifting up, just not in hip flexion. Right. Because because it's already tight there. Because so as would kick in. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Just to keep so as out of the picture. And then long term would be getting her back to being able to walk without pain. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Putting it all together. It's a it's a really hard. Um, I call it a little bit of a conundrum when somebody is in so much pain that they can't exercise and they know they need to lose weight. Yeah. Because it's really hard. So we actually had a discussion back in August about her starting to swim again, swimming. Mm -hmm. And she was an excellent swimmer. She swam for most of her life. Um, her body knows swimming and swimming is an extended prone position, meaning so as is gonna have a hard time doing all the work. Granted, you do get a lot of quad work in swimming, but you get a lot of glute work in swimming too. And you're not scrunched up and your hips aren't lifting up, right? So we did have a discussion about making time, carving out time for her to go swimming. And she promised that now this time when she goes back to Denmark, she will start swimming again. But I think that that might be the right path for her to get in shape, to get stronger, to lose some weight. And mm -hmm. then we could reintroduce the walking. Um, I find that if people's bodies know a sport, like for her, it's not like she has to go learn how to swim. She can actually go get in the water and start exercising, swimming. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it probably, it may not make her feel better, but it probably will not flare her symptoms. Well, just and the so, offload of the weight in the pool would be helpful, I would think, a little bit. Yeah, especially if there's an osteoarthritis component. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think it's going to make her symptoms worse. So, and, and losing weight will make her symptoms better. I'm 99% sure yeah. that if she could take off some weight, she, the plantar fascia would feel better at least. And something would start to feel better. Yeah. And, and she knows that also deep down. But like I said, it's a really hard, it's a hard subject. Um, yeah. I actually had an, another client just... This, earlier this week who um he told me I, I know I need to lose weight but I'm kind of just accepting that I may not be able to and so I have to just work you know I would just have to work through this and see if I can get moving more than it then maybe I can lose weight you know so um uh you know this is a really hard balance if you're in pain and you need to move to lose weight so yeah. finding ways to work with somebody like her um, and, and just get her moving more in the session would be really helpful, I think. Well, anything you could do that doesn't cause more pain at the moment is going to be really helpful. Yeah. So. Yeah. That's tricky. See, you did great. You said you didn't need <laughs> much help. You did great. <laughs> Can I ask you another SOAS question? Yeah, please. I'm still kind of like wrapping my head around the whole, how it works. Um, and I was listening to another class yesterday about, so the psoas comes down and it pulls on the, the what's it, the lesser trochanter, the front of your femur. Yeah. And then if it's too tight, it can pull your femur forward so that you're not seated correctly in, in the hip, hip joint. Is that correct? Potentially. I mean, it can definitely pull you into a tight, like a hip contracture flex, flexion. Uh -huh. um, so if it's short, because it comes from right here, yeah. it comes forward and, and then through um, to right there. So it either can have the effect of pulling that forward or pulling your spine forward. So either right. pulling you into lordosis or pulling mm -hmm. your hip into flexion. I'm not sure if it can totally unseat. I would think, um, I, I'm sure it affects your hip joint and hip joint function because it's pulling on one side. 
mm. um, and pulling you into one direction. But I'm not sure about unseating per se, if that happens yeah. or not. Yeah. Okay. Because there were, it was kind of a discussion about um, kind of like releasing the psoas so that your femur was more able to go posterior as opposed to being okay. held forward. Forward and, here. Yeah. Right. It can get held here for sure. So okay. then if we release the psoas, we can really make it come into this alignment here. Okay. Um, and even go into extension. Yeah. Okay. And, and so a lot of times too, the and this might be something that they were saying too, if this is stuck here, in order to correct this alignment, we change the alignment of the pelvis itself. And that's not good either, right? We might move the ilia to mm -hmm. seat the femur if the femur is stuck in this position and that's gonna offset the other side and then the SI joint. Like really it can cause a lot of trouble. It's a huge, it's a huge muscle that has an amazing, amazing amount of pull. Mm -hmm. and, and it can pull on so many joints that um, it can be super complex. So yeah. it can definitely wreak havoc if it's um, not doing a proper job or is too tight or is too weak or is too strong or is too loose. <laughs> Any of those things can cause a problem, an imbalance in that whole pelvic girdle, femur, pelvic girdle. Yeah. So and if you're doing, uh, sorry. Go ahead, please. If you're doing like the stretch, you're like over the roller. Um, mm -hmm. So when I do that, I mean, I love it. It feels so good but I generally feel it just in the front of my hip. Like, is that still getting everything up there? I'm sorry, I'm pointing to the screen, but is it still getting all the stuff up there? It's, it's great. If you can get the, to feel the stretch here, that's perfect. Okay. Um, that means that you're stabilizing off of its attachment points up here. What, if, you, if you stretch it and you feel it up here, it's because it's pulling you into an arch and we right. actually don't want that. But that's why it's so important, like in a lunge, for example, it's so important that the torso stay upright and not go forward because we take the stretch off, okay. right? So if, if I take the leg back and I lean forward um, versus coming up like this, yeah. oh, she's super flexy. <laughs> <Look at laughs> like now, uh, now I'm stretching across the hip. Yeah, because it goes right? down and around. Yep. If I go like this, I'm not really stretching it that much, mm -hmm. right? And if I arch my back while I go here and super, I can't make her do that, but if I super arch my back, I'm also shortening the distance from here to here. So if I arch forward, I'm not stretching either. So I almost have to pelvic tilt, coccyx curl, posterior tilt, and then take the leg back in mm -hmm. order to get the maximal stretch. So that's why I like on the roller too, because you're um, in this sort of position and you can work on rounding your lower back, mm -hmm. which puts more distance between here and the leg going over the roller and down okay. for the stretch, right? So I, I don't wanna arch, I wanna flex as I yeah. try and stretch the psoas. Okay, and so what about? Both. What right. about people when they're doing the lunge um, and they're upright and they get a lot of compression in the low back? Because mm -hmm. they're it's, arching. Because they're arching too oh. much. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you just so You want to oh. go the opposite. Yeah, coccyx curl kind of okay. direction. So if I came into it here, I could take the leg back, right? If I go like this, I don't get any stretch. If I go like this, I do start to get some stretch, but I, first of all, I don't want to turn. Mm -hmm. I want to keep square. And then I don't want to arch my back, right? Because uh -huh. now I'm taking, I'm actually releasing the pressure on the hip. Okay. Arch yeah, yeah. the back, right? I want to tuck up and under. Okay. And then I want to try and straighten. If I really want psoas, I want to try and straighten the back knee. Because okay. if I bend the back knee, then I involve rectus femoris. Quad. Right. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> You're very welcome. The mysterious psoas. <laughs> the mysterious psoas. And we could go on and on. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much for being here and oh doing gosh. this with me. Thank you. Yeah. I don't, I don't know where everyone else was tonight, but Aww. I feel like we had a really great 
um, talk about it. Hopefully it's helpful for you. So, oh my gosh, it's so helpful. It's like, you know, I'm kind of in like a vacuum. Like I don't have, I don't work in a busy bustling studio, so I don't get this kind of feedback or discussion really with anybody. (laughs) So um, it's, it's fantastic. Yeah. Great. Great. Well, thanks so much, Anne. And then um, I look forward to seeing you maybe next week. And if you have any questions, let me know. If you have a case study that you're curious about, we can also do one of yours. So you can let me know um, if you want to, if you want to kind of do, you could even send me a summary and we could post it and talk about it with everyone.